Okay, so Dave just told me that we're live. I guess I'm gonna have to trust him. Um, cool. Thanks for bearing with me, guys. This is all very, very new to me, and um, maybe to you guys too. Um, but anyway, how this is kind of gonna work is I'll play a little bit, and then. Um, anybody out there that wants to ask questions there's like a little chat thing on the side and you can ask some questions there and uh, I'll do my best to answer them and wow this is just such a weird unique experience I'm used to playing live I play a lot of shows a year and it's like you guys are right there in front of me and I feel your energy and this is definitely not that but uh, it's something else and it's cool too so let me play a little bit and uh, we'll see what that goes like. <laughs>
Cool, so um, <laughs> it's so funny playing here and knowing that there's an audience. Like, I know you guys are out there. I can see that there's people watching. But it kind of feels like I'm, I'm just, I mean, I am just at home. Uh, so it's a funny new era we've entered into. Um, anybody want to type something in the comments so I can talk to you guys? Are the comments working? Do I have to refresh my page? Dave, send me a text. If, oh, you did send me a text. Dave said everything sounds good, so that's a good thing. Um, oh, cool. We got some, some comments. Nice, guys. Yeah, keep talking to me. Um, any questions about um, anything guitar-wise or um, home studio-wise or how we're doing this? Why is this? It, that was really interesting to me. Um, Hey Marco, um, thou, hey Kevin, um, the whole system is really interesting to me. Like, um, it's probably something we'll all do a little bit of if this kind of thing continues. But basically, it's like, as guitar players, we already have this kind of crazy signal chain where we like play this instrument with our hands. You know, a little pick hitting a string, and then it goes through these pickups into a pedal board. Um, lots of little guitar pedals into an amplifier. There's a microphone in front of the amplifier. The microphone is going into an interface, which goes into a computer. Uh, the computer uh, sound is going into a, a software called Pro Tools. Pro Tools is going to a, a third party software called Loopback. Loopback sends it to OBS. OBS is the streaming platform that sends it to YouTube, and you guys are watching it on YouTube. So this like pretty intricate signal chain um, of like digitizing and sending little packets of information, all that's co it's all coming from just like me hitting strings on the guitar on, on, on the guitar, and I think it's pretty wild <laughs> how we've gotten here. 
but it's also rad because you guys are probably in LA or New York or wherever watching this and um, it's cool we, anybody can watch this anywhere around the world and I, I'm, I'm kind of I have one eye on it on YouTube and I see that it's like maybe 20 seconds delayed which isn't isn't too bad considering the distances it's traveling so I don't know food for thought Uh, there's a question. Do I ever play finger style or do I always pick? Well, solo guitar is not something I know that well. It's something that, you know, we're probably all going to be developing, us guitar players or any instrumentalist while we're here in quarantine, just because it's what we have. You know, I would love to play with the band. I miss playing with the band. Um, but this is what we got, you know, so I think... I think it's cool to, to develop it. Now, I wish I could develop it on a normal gig gig, you know, to be out there and um, play in front of people instead of kind of like, I've always been better at learning on the job, kind of. You know, like coming in as prepared as I could be and then growing in the moment, you know, playing with people who are better than me or, you know, just having to do it and doing it and, you know, growing in that way. So this is not my most, um, comfortable setting but it's it's a challenge and you know what better way to grow than to challenge yourself so um well i don't know that much about solo guitar yeah i think i do use a pick just because it's what i normally do but maybe with a little bit of fingers kind of thrown in there
cool. <laughs> so funny. Um, looking at these comments. Oh, some great questions. Um, all the guitars in the back. Yeah, I use those to record a lot. Um, um, and just kind of to learn how to play other guitars. Like, it's fun to learn how to play a Les Paul. It's definitely a different thing than knowing how to play a Strat or than an arch top. But a lot of them are more textural. Like, you have a baritone and a baritone acoustic. Um, some of the guitars are strung in Nashville tuning, meaning, like, they're strung like the high, uh, high strings of a 12-string guitar. So, like, electric Nashville tuning, acoustic Nashville tuning. And I use them for recording. Speaking of which, um, I use them all on this, which is my new record that comes out in um, two weeks, June 12th. This will be out. If you go to my website, there are links for all links, and um, you can watch a video on YouTube. You can stream the first single, and it looks kind of like this. Um, yeah, I'm super proud of it, and it has almost all of these guitars on it. Um, other side. So you guys are actually the first people that are seeing the whole design. This is a world premiere, kind of. Um, but uh, yeah, all these guitars are on it. And when I record on other people's projects, either from home or at the studio, you know, I like to have the option of recording different colors. You know, when you overdub guitars, overdubbing the same guitar, uh, like literally the same instrument, sometimes it kind of, the frequencies just kind of rub together and you can't really hear the separation quite as easily. So it's nice to, you know, track different parts with different guitars and kind of bring out the natural qualities of the instruments and it helps kind of separate them. That's what I found. So a lot of these I use for recording and sometimes, you know, in the professional world, um, people want a certain guitar. They're like, hey, can you bring a Martin acoustic to the session? Can you bring a, a Taylor? Can you bring, you know, because they're looking for that specific thing or, you know, um, and sometimes it's not necessary and sometimes, you know, it is, you know, it's, it's that sound. The Martin sounds like a Martin and the Les Paul sounds like a Les Paul. And, I don't know how much you can change that. Um, let's see um, some more questions. Uh, what pickups are in my Strat? Um, these are just the ones that came with it. So, you know, back to this guitar. I got this guitar when I was 13 years old. Um, it was, it's a nine, 1995 Tex-Mex guitar, Tex-Mex Strat that uh, I got in 96. And I never changed anything. It's just the same as it was when I bought it. It had one fret job, and I changed the tuners once. Um, so it cost about, I think, 200 bucks in 1996. And uh, I've just kept playing it, like, kind of out of familiarity and maybe a little bit of stubbornness. But um, the more I played it, the better it got. So that's maybe a little bit of a lesson about guitars. Like, you know, the more you play an instrument, it kind of breathes life into it, I think. You know, like part of the humanity and, and the lived experience of all the gigs you've done and all the sessions you've done and all the hours you've spent practicing kind of drip a little bit into the instrument, you know? So was this guitar great off the shelf? I don't know. Maybe it had something special to begin with. But I'd like to think that a lot of it came from just playing it, you know, for hours and hours on end. This guitar's. I mean, I don't know. People seem to go through guitars pretty fast. So in my mind, at least, this guitar has probably been played more than many guitars in the world. It's really been the guitar I've played almost all the time for 20 plus years, like, you know, countless hours a day and countless concerts. So it's really, I don't know, has a bit of a story. And uh, I like stories. You know, part of the enchantment of music is like being able to to create a narrative or to listen to a narrative, right? Like all our favorite players, like when Sonny Rollins plays or Hank Mobley or whoever, like they're telling, or Hendrix, Jimmy Page, they're kind of telling you a story. And uh, and that's what's so exciting, you know, to be able to follow along with it and like hear the story that John Coltrane's telling you at that moment in time, it's great. Um, so I feel like sometimes the instruments have, they help tell the story, you know, that's their job. And an instrument that has its own story can sometimes do that. So that's why I've stayed so loyal to this guitar. Um, what mics do you like to use for home recording stuff? Uh, well, for um, for this, we were going to do DPA because DPA is sponsoring these, but because of some other, you know, whatever, I'm just using what I regularly use, which is on, um, on my amp over here, I'm using a Royer 121. 
And those are just good, solid, very modern mics. Like, um, I tend to like older ribbon mics, like the RCA ribbon mics. But for a newer ribbon mic that you can get, you know, for under two thousand dollars, and that sounds great and is super reliable, I think the Royer stuff is awesome. Um, and uh, you know, there are other mics that I love to use in the studio. Like a Sony C thirty seven might be my favorite guitar mic. It's a cool old condenser mic, tube condenser mic, the C37A. But um, at home, I don't have that. So I have this Royer mic, and I think, I hope it sounds good out there. I don't know what it sounds like. It sounds good in the room. And I, I, I checked it in Pro Tools, and it sounds pretty good in Pro Tools. So hopefully it sounds cool in, in, in uh, coming from out of your speakers, too. Um, thanks for posting about the album, Sam, first. Yeah, if you go to www.nearfelder.com, um, there's links to like pre-order everything and um there uh is a link to the video there's a video for the single that my friend mariah did that i think came out really rad um so if you go to nearfelder.com you can find everything and soon there'll be sheet music up too for all the songs from the album there's also a second album coming like a second half of the album so there's a lot of exciting stuff on the horizon um mateo what have you been listening to in quarantine um a lot of stuff um there's a new album by a guy, a singer-songwriter songwriter from L.A. named Christian Lee Hudson that I think is fantastic. I think Harrison Whitford played guitar on it. There's some great guitar playing on it, but it's just a great record. The songs are, are just fantastic. So I've been really listening to that record a lot, um, even before it was out. Like I was kind of just listening to the songs that were the singles that were released one by one. I'm really kind of in love with that record right now. Um, that's the that's the first thing that comes to mind. I also like that Phoebe Bridgers' new record, what I've heard of it, um, what's out so far, um, and I look forward to hearing the rest of that. Oh, Andrew, cool, man. Good to see you. Yes, uh, I did some free lessons during the beginning of the lockdown because everything was so upside down, um, and uh, that was great. I did, you know, two free lessons a day for uh, 30 days. And I'd love to continue to do that, but um, I have to, I should probably at some point start charging for lessons again. So I think what I'll do to make it affordable is I'll do some master classes, like Zoom master classes, where like as many people as, as want can attend, you know, and I'll keep, it'll cost like 15 bucks or something. So that should be doable for people. And it'll be like an alternative that's not quite free, but it's cheap enough that we can do like some big group lessons and stuff. Um, Oh yeah, Sam first mentions, yes, there's a, there's a tip jar, a digital ch tip jar here. So what's cool about this is it goes to, um, to the, the workers at the club. Um, you know, it helps keep the club running and keeps the people that can't be employed by the club at the moment. It takes care of them too. So if you could just donate something, that would be awesome. Whatever you can, it doesn't have to be a hefty donation. Um, just, you know, to keep this place running the, and they're, you know, they're putting on this live stream, you know, Dave at, the club spent hours with me yesterday sorting all this stuff out. So they're they're putting in time and work in order to make things like this happen. And they're happening weekly. They got John Patitucci next week, Chico Pinheiro the week after. It's really cool. Like all these kind of free <laughs> concerts. And it's uh, it just blows me away. I'm still like wrapping my head around, around it all. I'm stoked that you guys are here. You know, there's, you could be doing anything with your time or probably watching any free live stream right now or archive of past live streams so thank you for being here with me the cool thing is that like even though you're not right there we can interact so keep asking questions and i'll play more and we'll talk more tell me if i'm talking too much um was the recording process of the new album different than golden age yes it was very different um golden age was just a, a quartet record and we did it you know, live in the studio, and then I added the few things that I added. This was a trio record, which was also done live in the studio, but the overdub process was much more extensive. So I, you know, we recorded it at Andy Taub's studio in Brooklyn, Brooklyn R Recording, which is my favorite studio in New York. And then I went uh, to my friend Joseph Bransifort's studio for the rest of the overdubs, and we did so many days of overdubs there's so much on there lots of keyboard parts that i played i sang some background parts i you know pretty much recorded every instrument i have guitar and other 
kind of instrument just to like find new textures and help try to tell the story of the songs in a different way it's still a trio record at the core it's just three guys playing trio but the other stuff kind of serves to to bring some of it out some of it was recorded live there were some keyboard parts i was kind of playing while you know moving my hands from the guitar to the keyboard but a lot of it was done after the fact and i've never made a record like that um it was kind of just like a and uh, a gift to myself of like let me explore these songs more in depth than i've had the option to explore songs on other people's records you know to have that time in the studio to have that time to take a week or a week and a half to overdub stuff so we had a lot of fun with it and i'm really proud of how it came out i'm super stoked for you guys to all hear it um did i do much of the editing of the album at home i did some i did some i'm not um as good with pro tools as i want to be so like editing guitar i can kind of do editing drums i'm not as like not as comfortable with my editing skills to like feel like i, I i'm unsure of myself i guess like if i if i edit a drum part i want to like send it to the drummer and be like does that sound right whereas uh these great engineers there's no question you know they're just like yes that's how that's how we do it so i'd like to get there you know um and maybe the next record i could do more of it by myself but with the trend to do everything by yourself these days like we're all like you know artists composers players and we run our social media and we you know now can do the records by ourselves at home um i think that's really cool and like you learn so much but one of the great things about especially we're talking about jazz music right like it's about the teamwork and the interplay and the fact that you're not just doing it all by yourself that you're working with other great people who you value and 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 trust with your music you know and i think it ends up greater than the sum of its parts like I'm so proud of all the people that worked on this record, starting with Jimmy McBride on drums and Matt Penman on bass, but extending to Andy, who recorded it, Joe, who did the overdubs, Dana Nielsen, who mixed it, Justin Bettman, who took the photos, um, Roland LaFox, who, you know, designed the, the whole package, you know, like everyone, Nate Wood, who mastered it. Um, I think I said Dana Nielsen, who mixed it. If not, you know, Dana Nielsen is such a big part of this record, you know, huge. His sonic imprint on it is enormous. Um, but it was me working with each of these people, you know, like, and crafting it the way I wanted, but using their skill set. And I feel like when you do it all yourself, it loses a bit of that magic of that, like interconnected person to person, people doing a thing together magic. And, you know, behind every great artist that we love, there's a whole group of unseen people, you know, that made it happen, that, you know, got the music to you, you know, th that promoted it, that, you know, so something about building a great team of great people is important to me and special and I think I think really cool you know and I think we should keep doing that um, cool so I think I've talked enough for now I'll play a little more
questions i love i love the questions um city of cranes band of other brothers yeah i love that band the problem with um that band is everyone is so busy and it's been impossible to 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 you know do a tour or keep playing you know between will d and keith carlock and jeff coffin and jeff babco um and myself you know um it's been hard to pin it to get, pin it down but we talked about doing a record in quarantine like everybody tracking a bit, putting songs together and kind of making another record now. We all have home studios, so it seems doable. You know, everyone's kind of, those guys especially are consummate recording pros. You know, like talk about recording, Will Lee, how many records has that guy been on? 10,000? More? 20,000? I have no idea. So um, it seems doable. I, we would love to play more. I love those guys so much. And I actually just spoke to Jeff Babco he just texted me right before this something about coffee. Hi, Jeff, if you're watching. <laughs> um, mailing list for master classes. Oh, God, I got to do that. The best way is, is to follow me on Instagram. Um, I think it just if you search Nierfelder on Instagram, and I'll post about it there. I'm trying to be better about social media and, uh, and about um, posting and all that stuff. I don't know. How do you guys feel about it? I mean, I know a lot of you guys are musicians, but social media, like, great. Like, we can all kind of make these connections. There's a lot of inspiration out there, but also it can kind of take a, you away from, like, your private musical space of, like, just creating just for the sake of creating. So I have mixed feelings about it still to this day. I, I understand the necessity of it for uh, the power, power of communication, but I just don't want to lose the 
you know, that at home, you know, love of music thing that powers this whole engine, right? Without that, it's nothing. And, you know, social media has just become so powerful. It seems to have kind of taken over a little bit. So um, that's on me, you know, just to preserve that and then still be able to, like, spread the message through social media. So, yeah, Instagram is, is my the one I know best and use. But I'm trying to get better at them all. So, um, uh, warm up. No, I don't. Um, I just, I mean, I just pick up my guitar. Like with all these songs, I don't know what song I'm going to play when I start. I kind of just want to play.
so as much as that was kind of a performance right for you guys out there somewhere um that's what i would do kind of in my practice and i, I would i would do it like that but i would i would probably stop more and, and fix you know if something was like oh that's not quite right or i didn't want to i didn't mean to do that i would i would stop but the and fix and work on it for a second but the general warm-up or practice thing is i i just play a lot um uh, and I work out specific things and I practice scales just like everybody else. But the majority of it is just kind of playing because I want to be able to make music, right? And um, practicing making music has been for me the most effective way to successfully make music on the bandstand. I think that if I were to just practice scales and arpeggios, I would end up being only able to play those things. So while those are all components of it, like just practicing playing music is first of all really fun and rewarding and um, doesn't feel like a waste of time at all in any way um, but sometimes there's there'll be a goal you know like I'll be like I'm gonna I'm gonna play Stella but I'm gonna try to try to play chords in the high register or something that would make it a little more practice but it's still I'm still trying to make it musical and, and make music out of it I'm still playing a song and trying to tell a story of that song in one way but I'm trying to just force myself into developing new new tools new methods of expression and so that's that's been my practice kind of vibe for a while now it, it seems to serve me well for the most part but I do definitely break it down and say okay well you know the rhythm was shaky here or I didn't really mean to do that or I need to know this scale better you know um, or it's not coming out right you know and to be honest like life in quarantine I haven't been playing guitar that much I've been kind of you know doing music for the love of it in the, in the way in a way that's kind of divorced from making a living out of it which is my normal life you know so it's a nice break to just like I'm gonna sit and play Bach on piano poorly for the day you know and it's just so great because it's like oh I'm, I'm doing something that i'll never i'll never get paid to play bach on piano but um the joy of it is like very very powerful and it kind of just reconnects you with oh wow i just love music so much i love playing music i love i love it so um when the world stopped at least for now you know um i'm reconnecting with that and um and now this is cool because this has been my first quasi performance in in a while i'm remembering what that's like even in in this new kind of way and maybe this is maybe this is it forever maybe this is the new normal i hope not but um one thing that's really cool i should tell you guys about too in addition to talking about this my new record that's um out on june 12th that i'm really proud of um one thing that you guys if you're interested you can check out is i played guitar for a great artist named ben platt um he's just a really terrific musician songwriter singer and we have a new Netflix special out. It was recorded live at Radio City Music Hall at the end of our tour. So if you go to Netflix and type in Ben Platt or Radio City, it should come up. And uh, I'm definitely doing a totally different thing, you know, just playing. There's a, maybe like a couple of short solos in there. There are. There's like, you know, 16-bar solo on one tune and a 12-bar solo on another tune. But for the most part, just playing rhythm guitar. And I love that. I just love, you know, playing texturally and having the right sound and supporting the artist and telling the story of those songs in that way it's very different from solo jazz guitar playing jazz standards obviously but it's i love it so much and uh i, I i'd love if you guys check that out too because that's that was a really fun project to work on um let me check out these questions um developing swing feel yeah, I definitely practiced it a lot, like just sitting with the metronome and just going, you know. Until it felt right. And playing stuff like that, like kind of just old school blues because it's the same. Thank you. 
of it um, maybe just kind of like an older style of, of music that was kind of around before um, drum sets you know when people played acoustic guitar and sang and um, the emotional connection is just everything there right because it's like a couple of chords and uh, a very vocal approach um, so I grew up as kind of like a blues kid like that was my after I kind of heard Jimmy Page and Eric Clapton and Hendrix, I fell in love with the blues. And Stevie Ray Vaughan was the guy that got me totally hooked. And I still kind of, you know, people say they don't hear it, but that's why I play this guitar. That's why there's a bit of like a percussive thing, kind of, you know. Um, it's not there's a lot of muted string there. That probably comes from checking out Stevie Ray Vaughan. So it's actually quite a big influence that you might not hear, but it's definitely there. But from him, Albert King, Albert Collins, B.B. King, um, Lightning Hopkins, Mississippi Fred McDowell, Mississippi John Hurt. I love that lead belly. I love that stuff so much. And, um, you know, the feel is so critical. Um, I think when I started playing jazz and realizing what jazz was and realizing that it wasn't just harmony, it wasn't just, you know, lines. It was so much more than that. I, I you know, spent a lot of time trying to figure out the feel and then I kind of realized that maybe I already knew it but I didn't realize that they were connected you know I thought I thought jazz was this different thing just because that's how it was kind of taught you know like blues is something you don't teach jazz is something you teach and I think that jazz is probably overtaught at this point right like well the notes are overtaught you worry so much about notes you forget about the big picture you forget about the story, you forget about narrative, you forget about dynamics, you forget about everything else that's equally important. Nobody talks about it because like with the blues, it might be unteachable in a way. You just have to open your mind to it. You have to be aware of it. Once you, it's like mindfulness and meditation, right? When you start being mindful, you kind of, oh, I didn't know I was doing that. I didn't know I felt that way or I didn't know I was reacting that way. If you take a step back, and music can be like that too. You start hearing things differently. Oh, I didn't realize that all this was going on and I was just 
blowing by it all because I was so worried about the notes because that's what I was taught. So I think um, feel-wise, like making that connection and being like, wow, I, th I think I already know how to do this. I just thought I was supposed to do something different because it's jazz. And then realizing that jazz is very human and very emotional and very all those things that we love about other styles of music but we don't necessarily think of as jazz uh, all the great players that's why we love them that's why we love Miles that's why we love Herbie that's why we love Sonny Rollins is because they they do all that Sonny Rollins you know he can play in one solo he'll play fast he'll play slow he'll play rubato he'll play swinging he'll play loud he'll play soft he'll you know every variation of anything and it doesn't sound disjunct it sounds complete it sounds like a story you know and that's what's the most important thing about it it's not about the licks or anything or the notes it's about the way he's able to tell a story that's so connected that's so human you know and uh to me that's that's the stuff i fell in love with when i first started playing guitar you know to ha have it have a voice i'm still figuring it out of course we all are but it's it's still what I love. Uh, transcription. Someone asked about transcriptions. Um, the, I didn't do much transcribing. I've never been a, a big transcriber. Every once in a while, if I heard something that I was like, what is that? I got to check that out. I would, I would go for it. But like just that would probably be like one line in the solo or something. But the one transcription thing that I did really um, stick with was uh, the Charlie Parker Omni book. Um, learning what bird played out of the omni book was huge for me because i was like oh this is how it all works together before that i was just kind of learning disjunct stuff that was like oh this is it and and specifically the voice leading meaning like how one note goes to another note you know it's not just notes moving kind of at random they kind of move like you take one note that's not part of that has some tension or something and you resolve it but maybe not right away Maybe there's like three or four other notes that happen after, but then it gets resolved. And I think if you look at it, it's not, it's not very different than Bach. It's like Bird and Bach are speaking basically the same musical language in terms of tension and resolution, at least. Like how tension hangs over and gets resolved eventually. Um, Bach and Bird are like, you know, it, there's, a, there's some sort of system at work. I don't know if it's something you could like mathematically write, but orally in your ears, you're like, oh, tension resolution i get it and it's really cool and you know charlie parker's probably the ultimate genius in our music you know he wrote he he created the language that we're all still dealing with you know and no one has ever done it better they've done it differently but no one's ever done it better um more 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 stuff from sam first um yeah alternative guitar summit with Julian Lage, uh, Gilad Hexman, Scott Metzger, Tim Miller, Joel Harrison. That's coming up. You can sign up for that. That's an opportunity to, sign, to study with all of us. I'll be doing more of my lessons. This is on my website, nearfilter.com. Where's the camera? Uh, nearfilter.com. New record. Really proud of it. Hope you guys check it out. Um, what else? Uh, Netflix special with Ben Platt. Um, oh, cool. And there's, and yeah, Sam first is doing a great job in the chat of like providing all these comments. Um, another guitar band album in the future. I would love to tell, uh, tell Bob Reynolds, let's do it again. We, we filmed some more stuff and then we ha he hasn't put it out yet. I hope that, you know, I hope it sees the light of day cause it's good. You know, uh, that's such a special band. Hi, Sandra. Um, was the guitar band recording true live? Yes, it's live. It's with one. It was from one show. Uh, when we made that, we had, some of us had never met before. We didn't have a rehearsal. It's it's a very very seat of your pants recording, and I think that's why it came out the way it did. It was just like it's just a special moment. It could have gone the other way completely. It could have been a disaster, but. Um, Oh, Kevin Miller asked a great question. Kevin, if you guys don't know Kevin Miller, he's an um, amazing young guitar player that I, I met at the new school, but he's just really, really unique, phenomenal player that I'm sure you'll all be hearing a lot from. Um, and he asked, what do, what do I think we can do as artists and human beings in general to fight back against some of the horrible things going on in the world today? That's a really deep question. 
Um, when I got to college, September 11th had just happened. And like literally on my first day of classes was September 11th. So obviously there were no classes that day and just kind of walking around trying to figure out what to do. Um, especially because I came from New York, you know, to go to school and then all of a sudden. So, and people were asking a lot of those questions too. Like, what does music mean in light of this? Um, I think that all music is political um, by its nature. Just because the way the world works, there are places when, where you can't play music. Secular music is not allowed or anything that you call music is not, is forbidden. You know, music has a very powerful message even when it's instrumental, if it's done the right way. It's a powerful force because it moves people's emotions. You know, so as artists, I think we can create music that creates positive emotions in people. Um, I know that might sound like a bit like head in the clouds, but it's really true. And, and I think the, the testament to it is the limitation of music in oppressive um, regimes because they know that it's powerful. Um, there's, you know, some kind of more tragic uses of music. There's a, a story about the Rwandan genocide, this musician who became a war criminal because he started writing songs about killing the other side, you know, and people went and did it. You know what I mean? The song stirred up something in them and they were like, yeah, let's go kill people, you know? Um, if music can make you do that, can make you do that terrible thing, it's a pretty powerful force you know what i mean and that's we've seen the dark side of it but there's also the opposite right so music can kind of create some powerful you know positive vibrations in the universe i don't understand how it works you know the science of it is something that you know we don't know but you see alzheimer's patients you know people in the in their 90s that can't remember their sons and daughters you play them a song that they knew when they were younger and they start singing along and it lights up their face, you know what I mean? So there's something about the deep imprint of music on the brain that um, I don't think we fully understand yet, but it's, it's a powerful force. I mean, just the fact that we're all hanging out here together, something's happening, you know, like through music, you know, and it's not any, it's not, none of us have any ownership over music. Like it just is this thing that we're all, you know, we we like we try to touch it you know we try to connect our souls to it and through our instruments but it's this this i don't know it's this vast thing so what can we do i mean we can be vocal about it um from our platforms as best we can um and we can be honest about what we believe in and we can be informed uh, and beyond that our job is to create music and hopefully we create the right kind the kind that that helps people and connects people. Um, a few more questions and then we're probably running out of time. Um, must have guitar pedals. You know, I just want to give a shout out to one guy in particular. And um, one pedal maker in particular, a guy named Jesse Davey he's a monstrous guitar player like one of my favorite players and he makes pedals too and the company's called king tone and i always try to shout them out just because i think they're so good they're like the best pedals like they they just sound awesome you turn one on and like any setting sounds good like what pedal does that most pedals that i have at least it's like oh it doesn't sound good it doesn't sound good oh there's something really cool okay i like that you know i'll just keep it there and use that pedal great but his pedals are like any setting sounds great. They just sound different. It's amazing. So King Tone, King Tone Audio or King Tone Pedals or whatever, if you look that up, um, in that Netflix special, I used a lot of them. I used the Blues Power. I used the, um, uh, I forgot, the Octave Fuzz. I it's called the Octa Land. Uh, it's like an Octave Fuzz pedal. I used that a bunch. And I used the Duelist a bunch, which is like two channels, um, dirty and dirtier. So they're mostly boosts. I know he makes a Univibe clone now, but like everything I've heard of his, even though, you know, the ones that I, I don't have that I've heard online are just so good. And um, I'm all for it. Like someone who's just making something so awesome. It's, it's really cool, especially in the pedal world, because there's such a, 
you know, a glut of stuff out there, um, you know, this is something that's like stands out as just being so awesome. Uh, another one that I ha that I got that's really cool is the grease juicer. Uh, the grease juicer is made by, um, I was basically on the company. There's a great drummer in LA named Kurt Bisquiera and Kurt also plays bass. And, um, he developed this like, like envelope filter for the bass. You know, he's mainly a drummer, but like he created this pedal with this guy and it's awesome. It's just a really cool, funky, dirty pedal. So the grease juicer, that's another one. I, I, I don't know, I have it. I haven't used it as much because envelope filter is not like an essential component in my sound. But every time I go to play with it, I'm like, this pedal rules. So uh, that's another one. Um, and then, yeah, uh, why such a long time between solo recordings? Just busy playing on other projects? Yes, I've been fortunate to be super, super busy. Um, all with stuff that I love, whether it's with, you know, um, any number of awesome artists that I've been fortunate to play with. Uh, but it's a bit of like, like leaving, putting myself last a little bit, which I shouldn't do. You know, it's been like, oh, well, you know, I got called to play this tour, or this whatever, this record date. Let me focus on that because like someone's thought highly enough to call me and is paying me to fly to wherever to do this thing. Um, so maybe my stuff, you know, I can put that on the back burner and I shouldn't do that because I really believe in my music and, um, and you guys have been very supportive of it. So um, New Year's resolution or New World resolution, um, if we're in a new world right now, which it feels like we are, make some more of my own music. So uh, I have two new records for you guys though, and one of them's right here. I uh, have it in my hands, which feels really cool. Um, Roland the Fox did this cover art, he's the man. Um, one last time there it is it comes out in two weeks and uh and that's that and um this has been really fun you know i haven't i haven't played that much in the last few weeks so i hope it was okay but uh i hope i'll do more of these you know i want to now that we figured out the live streaming thing it seems like it'll be totally easy to do again so thanks so much for sam first to sam first for having me and i just want to mention before i leave that um there's a tip jar for this event and uh, most of the proceeds of that go to benefit the club. Keep the club open. That's a great club if you haven't been there. Awesome, really cool space that supports musicians. Um, a listening room that supports musicians and to their staff who are out of work now because the club cannot be open in, in these times during these circumstances. So um, please support all of us if you can. Whatever you can throw in there is cool and we appreciate it. And, uh, and thank you guys so much for hanging out. It's been really, really cool. I hope you guys had a good time. I hope I didn't talk too much or play too much or whatever, but uh, I had a great time hanging with you all. Peace, everybody. Stay in touch. And, you know, um, I'm on Instagram if you don't follow me there and Twitter and Facebook, and I have a website that has a contact link. You can email me directly. So we can all be in touch and, um, you know, just stay connected during this uh very interesting time that we found ourselves in. Thank you all.